Southern Baptists read the Protestant Bible, which contains 66 books. The Catholic Bible has those identical 66 books plus an additional seven. So who's reading the Bible that Jesus read? To give you a little background, um, the Protestant Bible uh, was first translated by Martin Luther when uh, he protested, hence Protestant, he protested some abuses that were going on in the Catholic Church, which the Catholic Church acknowledged and addressed. Uh, but then he went further and wanted to reform the church. He didn't want to start a new church. He, he never intended to start a new church because he knew that Jesus uh, prayed for unity and then that would that would be a sin. But his followers, of course, took on you know took on a life of his own and called their church the Lutheran Church after him. And then you know 500 years later, we have 32,000 different Christian churches. So the Protestant Reformation created this new Bible. And basically, what they did. What Martin Luther did in 1522, he took out seven books out of the Old Testament <clears throat> called the Deuterocanonical books, and they're Tobit, Judith, 1 Maccabees, 2 Maccabees, Wisdom of Solomon, Sirach, and Baruch. Okay? But what most Protestants, and you know, I was a Protestant evangelical for 25 years or so, and I never knew this, was he took out four books from the New Testament as well. He took out the book of Revelations, Hebrews, James, and Jude. Now, the Protestants were smart enough to put those back in their Bibles, thank God, but they weren't smart enough to put the seven Old Testament books in. The, old, the seven Old Testament books are called the Deuterocanonical. Deuter means late, later, or after, or, or second. Canonical, just meaning inspired by God, scriptural, that can be contained in the readings of the church. Now, according to J.N.D. Kelly, a Protestant historian and theologian, the first, second, and third century Christians, um, overwhelming, there was no doubt, there was no argument, they all accepted those seven books. So, the first century Christians, the apostles, the second century Christians, those who were taught by the apostles, and the third century Christians uh, who were taught by them. Excuse me. Uh, one more time here. Um, they all accepted this. So like Carl Keating, an attorney and Catholic apologist, always says, as an attorney, who are you going to believe? The people that were there or someone who came 1,500 years later? Martin Luther. Because he didn't translate his Bible until 1522. Okay, so the book, uh, J.D. Kelly, uh, if you want to check it out yourself, wrote this book, Early Christian Doctrines. And like I said, J.D. Kelly is a Protestant theologian and historian. Also, Timothy Michael Law, which uh, got a PhD from Oxford in ancient history, grew up a fundamental Southern Baptist, uh, so calls himself a Christian. I don't know. If he's still a Southern Baptist or not, it's hard to tell with his book, uh, When God Spoke Greek, is uh, his latest book, where he explains, again, that the early Christians, there was no doubt they accepted those seven books. And the reason being is because during the early church, there were several, several different Old Testament texts. The one we use today, uh, Protestants use today in the in the, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Masoretic text didn't have these seven Deuterocanonical books. But the most popular book that uh, the Jews all accepted, uh, most popular uh, text, I should say, because it weren't, wasn't a book yet, it had scrolls. They later put them into a book called the Codex in the first century. And in fact, the Christians actually popularized the Codex. They're, they're actually, thankfully for the Christians, we have books today, because that's how they put all their Bibles that they thought were canonical in it including these seven Deuterocanonical books. Um, but the, the, the Greek Septuagint text had the seven Deuterocanonical books. And because uh, most of the Western world spoke Greek, uh, that was generally 
the Bible they read. They accepted the Hebrew Masoretic text, but they always referred back to the uh, Greek Septuagint. In fact, according to Timothy Michael Law, uh, who I just mentioned, most of the time in the New Testament, when the uh, writers are referring to the Old Testament, they're quoting the Greek Septuagint. And the reason being is the Greek Septuagint, and the word Septuagint just means 70 in Greek, uh, because the belief, and you know, there's no way of proving this, it's uh, tradition, I guess. Um, the belief was that that book, the Septuagint, was translated by 72 Hebrew scholars, uh, six from each of the 12 tribes of Judah, each of the 12 tribes. So uh, that's where they come up with the word Septuagint. But according to Timothy and Michael Law, the Oxford PhD who studies ancient texts, uh, he said these were definitely translated from the oldest Hebrew available. So the Greek Septuagint uh, was more detailed. Like, for example, in Isaiah, where Isaiah prophesizes about the birth of Christ, in the Hebrew Masoretic text, it says a young woman will give birth. But in the Greek Septuagint, it says a young virgin. You know, so the Hebrew text wasn't wrong, but it wasn't as detailed, do you see? And there's hundreds of references like that, that the New Testament writers refer back to the Greek Septuagint. So they accepted the Greek Septuagint as scripture. And so why did the Catholic Church keep those seven deuterocanonical books in their Bible even till today? And why did Martin Luther 1500 years later take them out? Well, I'll give you Martin Luther's explanation and then I'll give you the Catholic Church's explanation. So Martin Luther said that in 90 AD, a group of Hebrew scholars uh, at the Council of Jamania, it's like a group of 10 or 11, and historians say that this may not be true either. And we don't know for sure. Most likely not true that this happened. But according to Martin Luther, and this is what they, they thought in the 1500s, according to the history that they had, um, these Jewish scholars accepted only as scriptural the Masoretic text. They didn't accept the Greek Septuagint. So the Masoretic text, these Hebrew texts, uh, did not have the seven books. So that was Martin Luther's explanation. Now, as far as his explanation for the four New Testament books he took out, he basically said they weren't in line with the rest of the Bible, with the rest of the New Testament. Like, for example, he took out James, because in James 2.22, I believe it is, I know it's James 2, I think it's 21 or 22 verse, uh, James says, we're saved by works and not by faith alone. It's the only place where faith and alone are together. So he didn't like that. He couldn't understand how that could, could uh, coincide with Romans where it says we're saved by faith. So he took that book out and then add the word alone to faith, faith alone, which Bible translators later took out and today they don't put in because they know that's not there. So, in the same way, he didn't like the Deuterocanonical books, because in the Maccabees it talks about praying for the, bed, the dead, and he disagreed with praying for the dead. So, in my opinion, he took out books he disagreed with. And who gave him this authority? Well, he believed the Bible alone gives us authority. Which is a circular defeating argument, because nowhere in the Bible does it tell you which books should be in the Bible. So I believe Martin Luther had a very weak argument for taking these books out. Now, what argument does the Catholic Church give to leave them in? Well, according to the Catholic Church, Jesus took the authority from the Jews and gave it to the Church. So those, even if that's true, that 12 scholars, 12 Hebrew scholars, um, said that the Greek Septuagint isn't, isn't scriptural. They didn't have the authority over the church to make that decision. Christ gave that authority to the church when he said to St. Peter, 
I give you the keys of the kingdom. What you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. You see, the Old Testament keys always signified, symbolized the authority. So when a master of an estate would leave, he would give one of his servants the keys to his kingdom or to his estate until he came back. If you left on business or a trip or whatever. And that servant had the authority to make decisions for him. So Jesus gave the authority to the church. And there was only one church until Martin Luther. So the church was the Catholic church. And what did the church decide? Well, the church had councils. And if you look, and if, and if your Bible alone, look to your Bible... In Acts 15, when the church had a church, the first church council, the Council of Jerusalem, where some of the Christians were saying, because the first Christians were Jews, uh, and they were saying when Gentiles got saved, they had to get circumcised and they had to follow the law of Moses. So the apostles had a meeting, a council, and they decided, no, they don't need to be circumcised. And you can look that up, Acts chapter 15, read the whole chapter, and you'll see this. And nowhere in it did, did they say, oh, let's check to see what the Bible says. No. They said, let's pray and see what the Holy Spirit says. So they were, the church made that decision, not based on Bible alone, but based on their authority that Jesus gave them when he gave them the keys of the kingdom. And then throughout church history, there were several other, you know, many councils. And in the Council of Rome in 382 A.D., the Council of Hippo, uh, so let me make sure I get my dates right, 396, no, I'm sorry, 393, the Council of Hippo, and the Councils of Carthage, 397 and 419 AD, they decided on a lot of items, and they called them canons, you know, laws. And one of the, in, in all, all of those four councils I mentioned, they go over the canons of Scripture. That's why we say, is that canonical? You know, Protestants don't talk about any other canons. They only talk about the canon of scriptural. But they get it from these councils, believe it or not. And I'll just, I'll give you an example. You can Google this. I, I just uh, Googled the Council of Cartridge 419. I don't know if you can see it with the bright light, but Canon 24. Nothing, be, that nothing, they, just, they decided, all these canons. They're like over 100. But Canon 24, that nothing be read in church besides the canonical scripture. Item that besides the canonical scripture, nothing be read in church under the name of divine scripture. But the canonical scriptures are listed as follows. And it goes from Genesis all the way down to Revelations. Uh, but if you look in there, you'll see Maccabees, you'll see Tobit, you'll see Judith. Uh, and the same thing if you look at all those other councils. And in fact, you know, Protestant scholars will not deny that. If they're still Protestants, they'll just say, well, they made a mistake about those seven deuterocanonical books. That's, that's all they'll say. They won't deny that the early church that was closest to Christ uh, did not deny these were scriptural. So, um, if you do look it up, just know that they sometimes the church put them in different orders and they call different books different names. Like, for example, uh, the four books of Kings. In today's Catholic and Protestant Bibles, they have 1 Kings, 2 Kings, and then they have 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel. There they put all those four books together. Same identical books, they're just categorized and titled different. And same thing, they put the 12 books of the, the prophets. Uh, you know, so stuff like that. So you just, that's how you'll come up with the 73. So, the early church has always believed that those seven books were canonical, and today Protestants deny it. So who's right and who's wrong? That's the question. Uh, most, most Protestants will tell you, because they believe, and you know, I was a Protestant 25 years, you know, I was evangelical, but I call myself Baptocostal because I was heavily involved in Pentecostals and Baptist churches. Um, I would just call myself a Christian. I wouldn't label myself back then. Now I call myself a Catholic Christian because it distinguishes from the church that Christ established 2,000 years ago from all these different churches that man established. But I believe Christ established one church according to history 
That church was the Catholic Church, and Martin Luther had no authority to take those books out. So the first sec century Christians and the Jews in the first century all accepted the Greek Septuagint. And Jesus, there's no doubt, read the Greek Septuagint. Now he also read the Masoretic Hebrew text as well. And even today, Protestant and Catholic Bible translators will use both texts for whatever reason. They'll use the Masoretic text and they'll use the Greek Septuagint text to try and get the best, because they complement one another, to get the best uh, meaning of each sentence they put in the Bible. So your Protestant Bible isn't wrong, it's just missing seven books. So for my Bible-believing Christian friends, I invite you to read the whole Bible and go out and buy yourself a Catholic Bible. And uh, if you want to investigate what I'm saying, I would recommend uh, Early Christian Doctrines, Doctrines by J.N.D. Kelly, uh, Protestant. Also, uh, Timothy Michael Law, another Protestant scholar. But this book isn't written. If you read it, it's more from a, like a scholarly viewpoint. So if I didn't look this guy up, I wouldn't know his background because he really, he just comes across reading, uh, explaining things like a scholar would to a class. You know, he could, you know, like a, a secular presentation, I would say. He gives a secular presentation in this book. But, uh, but the guy who recommended that book to me was a man named Devin Rose. And more than them, I recommend this book, The Protestant Dilemma by Devin Rose. And um, I got that book like five years ago, and I couldn't put it down. I think I demolished it in like three hours, uh, you know. I started reading it right before lunch. I'm eating lunch, I'm reading it, and I just didn't stop. The, that Protestant Dilemma by Devin Rose, highly recommend it. And um, funny thing, I tried to get a hold of the guy, and somehow, I don't remember how I got his email, but I emailed him, and he's such a humble guy, he emailed me back, Devin Rose. And I kept the correspondence when I was a, you know, just went back to the Catholic Church, asked him a million questions, and he, he would always reply and answer. And, um, since then, he's written a lot of books. He's got pretty popular. So I emailed him thinking he probably won't email me back. He'll be too busy. And sure enough, within 24 hours, I got an email back. And uh, he answered a question I had. And uh, he recommended that book, When God Spoke Greek, by Timothy Michael Law. So uh, there you have it. Now you know how I do my research. I just bug people. <laughs> so uh, God bless and stay Catholic.